we turn to Daniel Levy, president of the U.S. Middle East Project and a former peace negotiator in Israel. He joins us from uh, London. Daniel, um, let me move on to what we saw happen at the U.N. Security Council. The U.S. says now is not the right time for a permanent uh, ceasefire. Thomas Greenfield, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., says it would jeopardize sensitive negotiations. What she said is derailing, that could derail the exhaustive ongoing diplomatic efforts to secure and release the hostages. What do you make of the U.S. explanation that now is not the right time for a permanent ceasefire? I'm sure you've heard from our correspondent also uh, past reports about how horrific the situation in Gaza is. So if now is not the right time, I'm not sure I understand when would be a good time. You and me both, Asie. I'm still trying to absorb what your correspondent shared. One in two children, every other child, acute malnutrition. One in six. Let me correct you there. One in six. I apologize. That's okay. That the feed wasn't good. That's quite bad enough, isn't it? Yes. That's on top of the 12,000 uh, approximately children who have, who have perished. What that means is that even if we get a ceasefire, even if the humanitarian assistance does come through, big ifs, the tale of what has been done to the civilian population in Gaza is going to blight, impact those lives, probably for as long as those kids grow up and live. And yet, as you have noted, we have the U.S. administration continuing to tell us, no, the fighting shouldn't come to an end. We can have a temporary ceasefire. It's exactly the same language they've used up until now, a pause. And you really scratch your head and ask, how many need to die? How many need to have their lives permanently impacted? How much devastation needs to take place? And by the way, the only way you're going to get the hostages out as well the Israelis being held in Gaza is via a, a permanent ceasefire. What so is she talking about, Daniel? Why does she believe a permanent ceasefire would jeopardize sensitive negotiations? You are a former negotiator. Talk to me from that perspective. What does she mean? How would it possibly derail or jeopardize negotiations? I'm afraid that there is no good answer to that, Asie, and one has to uh, unfortunately call this for what it is, uh, which is untruths. This is simply uh, misdirection, simply telling the world something that is not the case. What I would say um, is the following. When you have the US administration apparently not wanting to see the Israeli ground invasion in Rafah, where 1.5 million Palestinian civilians are kettled. Frustrated that Israel has not been listening to America's um, advice in terms of how the war is conducted. Frustrated, apparently, that it is not getting humanitarian assistance. We had the unedifying site of Flowergate, where at the highest level, the US president, the national security advisor, was on the phone trying to get flour into Gaza being held up at Israeli ports. So you have this apparent frustration, and yet alongside it, you have the United States refusing to join the rest of the international community. This was a 13 to one with the country where I am apparently continuing not to have an opinion and abstaining. The well, UK. the US this was a is- 13, yes, This was a 13, one second, Asia. Okay. This was a 13 to one vote. And America, at the same time as it's doing what it's doing at the UN, is also arming Israel. We had reports just recently in the Wall Street Journal that the flow of munitions without which Israel couldn't continue the war. So the Israelis look at the administration. They hear when the administration says, hey, we'd like to see you do this differently. But what they see every day is American weakness, and therefore they dismiss the Americans. They don't take them seriously, and they don't deserve to be taken seriously. Yeah, I mean, as the old saying goes, actions sometimes speak louder than words. But let me tell you what the U.S. is doing, which I'm sure you heard in our report. For the first time, uh, the resolution they're introducing does have the word ceasefire in it. 
a temporary in ceasefire in Gaza as soon as it's practical. The language falls short of immediate ceasefire. Daniel, vague wording here. What does practical even mean? Who gets to decide when a temporary ceasefire is practical? Well, I say you and I both know that, that words are a wonderful thing. You can, you can massage and launder all kinds of meanings by trying to bamboozle people with words. And that's what we're hearing here. Because a, temp a temporary ceasefire is a pause that allows the war to continue. When practically possible is meaningless. It means do bad, continue to do your worst. And it's really interesting because what I think we're seeing with the US position is what we hear in New York at the Security Council is a variation of what we're hearing in Israel's defense from the very, very small minority of countries who are disagreeing with the position put forward by Palestine, South Africa and others in The Hague in these other hearings at the International Court of Justice happening right now. And in both places, the US position is keep international law out of this conflict. Let's have the politics of asymmetry and of bullying. America is powerful. Israel is powerful. We can bully the Palestinians into not having a ceasefire. We can bully the Palestinians into accepting a peace process which does not defend their rights, which confers might is right, which keeps things in an apartheid reality. And what the pushback that's happening in The Hague and that's happening in New York at the UN Security Council is that you should not separate this question of, of a dignified, just peace from the question of international law. In fact, international law needs to be at its center. That's why 24 of the states and international governing organizations who have made submissions to The Hague at the ICJ have used a reference to apartheid. And so the big challenge here is, is international law disposable? irrelevant when it's inconvenient for America and its allies. And unfortunately, that's where we are. It's a broken international system. America yet again took an ax to it today to break it further. And we're seeing America use the playbook, unfortunately, that they accuse others of using elsewhere. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Daniel Levy, uh, as always, um, so many more questions uh, for you. And as always, we are out of time. So we will leave it for next time. Thank you very much.